everybody. I want to show you this cool shirt I got. It says, peace, life is good. I got that in honor of, of the last four weeks when I talked about perfect peace. We want to have perfect peace. God wants us to have perfect peace. So I'm going to be talking about something different today that hopefully will be a real blessing to you. You know, in our society that we live in now, if someone confronts another person about their sinful life or a sin that they're committing or a lifestyle of sin or immorality, that someone quickly usually is rebuked um, with a quote from Jesus. Do not judge or you too will be judged. And so Jesus absolutely did say that. But we also find throughout the Old and the New Testament that we are supposed to judge many, many things. In the Old Testament, God put judges in place. There's a whole book in the Bible called Judges. There's Gideon and Samson. They're both judges in the Old Testament. I want you to think about um, these examples of ways that we need to judge other people's character and integrity. Uh, we need to judge a person or a company's character and ethics when we employ them. You know, a lot of people don't do this and they end up being scammed because they just didn't take, take the time to check a person's references. They just trusted what they said. We need to judge people when we work with them and count on them to fulfill requirements. We need to judge someone when we consider them for marriage. And hopefully, uh, if you're considering marriage or have, you've taken a lot of thought to judge that person. We need to judge our children when we're training them and shaping and molding them and their character uh, so we can make sure that they develop emotionally and that they develop a worth ethic and that they become responsible. A teacher needs to judge her or his students, their achievements, their failures, and where they need additional help. We need to judge uh, those we choose to be our leaders. We need to judge prophecies, and we need to judge if someone is a prophet sent by God or not. We need to judge those who we choose to be close friends to, and we need to judge the news and the entertainment that we consume. So um, in a lot of ways, it comes down to what Jesus meant in judge not or, or you'll be judged by the same measure or uh, what, the, what the definition is when the Bible talks about all these other ways we're supposed to judge. So judge means to properly distinguish, to decide, to try, to conclude, to determine, to esteem, to ordain, to call into question, and to think, and in, as Jesus was referring to judging, to condemn, or to punish, or to damn. So let's read the rest of what Jesus said. It's found in, in Matthew 7, Matthew 7, verse 1, and I'm reading out of the NIV. It says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Wow. <clears throat> so I'm titling this, this message, Judge or Judge Not. So Jesus told us not to judge people. Did you know that there's whole ministries whose goal is to find fault with other Christians, especially with the Christian leaders, teachers, authors, and worship leaders? You know, Jesus was addressing people who were fault finders, people who thought they were better than others who were hypocrites. The Pharisees, the religious people, Jesus is condemning the spirit of fault finding. What Jesus is forbidding is hypocritical judgment, judging others by a standard that we don't want to live by ourselves. You know, this kind of uh, judging can be found, a very good example of it can be found in the book of John. In John 8 verse 1, John 8 verse 1 says, 
But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and, Jesus, and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, uh, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing uh, him, accusing Jesus. But Jesus bent down and start, start. Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, "If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first one to throw a stone at her." Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, and the woman was still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. You know, it reminds me of certain preachers who fervently preach against sexual sin, but they are looking at pornography, hiring prostitutes, committing adultery, or having the same-sex relationships. So what Jesus is saying is that we all need to look at ourselves before putting someone else under a microscope. We should be humble always. We should be mature in our dealings with other people. We should always have reconciliation with God in mind and the state of a person's soul. We can see here that Jesus addressed the woman and said, go now and leave your life of sin. He didn't, he didn't, uh, say she should be stoned, he didn't disgrace her in public, but he did tell her, you know, recognize the sin that she had in her life and said, go now and don't sin anymore. Turn around, turn your life around, leave this sin. That being said, what I'm going to talk about today is the other side of the coin. The Bible says so much about the need to judge people and that's not talked about very much today but it certainly is talked about in the Bible. You know, there's kind of like a, 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 it's just kind of like abhorred in our society to judge anything, but the Bible tells us we need to judge. <clears throat> there's several reasons for that. God wants us to recognize how dangerous it is to allow sin to be normalized, how dangerous it is to be comfortable and casual about sin in our lives and sin in our churches. God also wants there to be a separation between good and evil, between light and darkness. And God knows that if we allow sin in our midst, that we will be drugged down and influenced by it. So let's look at some examples in the Bible where uh, sin was judged. Um, in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul writes, it says, It is actually reported there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that does not occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife, and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather be filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Well, Paul is saying that someone who is committing sexual immorality in your church should be put out of the church. And verse 9 says, I have written you in my letter not to associate with more immoral, sexually immoral people. Do uh, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and the swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the whole world. <laughs> But now I'm writing that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral, immoral, or greedy, or an idolater, or a slanderer, or a drunkard, or a swindler. With such a man do not even eat. So how would we realize that a person who is doing those things, uh, if, if we didn't have some kind of judgment in our minds and in our hearts? <clears throat> 
we have to have some kind of judgment to recognize these things and, and that they're serious. In verse 12, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. So the Apostle Paul is telling the church in Corinth that they should be judging uh, sin in the members of their church. And if a person is in sin and refuses to repent, the Bible says that that wicked person should be expelled. Now that, that kind of thing isn't going to float anybody's boat today because people want to be comfortable in their life of sin and attend their church and, uh, you know, listen to the sermons and worship God, you know, sing during the song service. They're not really worshiping God. <coughs> and just be comfortable. But uh, the Corinthians were going to tolerate sin. And so th in this chapter, Paul says that they were boasting and proud of themselves. The Corinthians were actually boasting and proud of themselves about how tolerant they were of this sin. They were not going to be judgmental. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a thing about being judgmental that's so looked down upon, but we need, do need to have judgment in cer certain circumstances. You know, on a lot of sports teams and a lot of workplaces, a lot of uh, schools, there's a code of con conduct. Well, did you know that Christians also have a code of conduct? And like in the workplace or a sports team, our, our um, schools, there are consequences if you don't live by the code of conduct. And in the Christian uh, church, Jesus, the Bible has put in consequences if you don't abide by the code of conduct. And that's not talked about at all today, um, not at all, but uh, there's not supposed to be sin in the church. Um, what happened here did call for judgment, and we find that the goal of this judgment uh, is in verse 5. It says that he himself will be saved on the day that she, the Lord returns. The whole goal of judgment in the church is reconciliation, to bring a person who is sinning to repentance and restore them to the body of Christ. It's a humble thing, it's a loving thing, it's a kind thing, and it's, um, it's a thing that should bring a person to their knees. Um, what Paul commanded also helped remove a false sense of security uh, that the sinning might, man might have in the body of Christ. Um, Warren Worsaby wrote, um, they couldn't just ignore sin and let him ignore it, pretending it wasn't there. If the man refused to face his sin, the church must face it for him, for his sake and for, the, for their sake. Um, all discipline in the church is to be carried out in an attitude of restoration, not condemnation. You know, if someone is found in sin, um, one of the worst things you can do is spread that around to other people and tell other people about it. Um, then you're as guilty as that person. The whole goal is to restore that person to right living before the Lord. Um, and he continues on to say, Paul does not say the church should take away the sinning man's salvation. The church does not grant salvation and it certainly can't take it away. But there are cases for the good of the sinner and for the good of the church when someone should be put out of the congregation. They are to be put outside the congregation until they repent. In today's church culture, this rarely brings a sinner to repentance because they can so easily just go to another church and pretend that nothing happened at their old church. Or it is easy for them to play the victim and act as if their former church was cruel towards them while it is true that some churches have been cruel toward their members and have unjustly put out some of the congregation, it does not mean that the church should never practice biblical principles, the biblical principles Paul teaches here. It is to be done for both the good of the church and the good of the sinner. So the goal of judging this man or any other Christian who is living in sin is to restore them, not to condemn them to humbly bring them to repentance. 
By expelling the wicked man from among you, the congregation maintained holiness and sin was recognized as serious. The goal was to deal with sin here on this earth in hopes that that person would repent and be reconciled back to God and to the church body. It's all about love. Love does address sin. You know, in this example, the church followed Paul's instructions and it's believed according to 2 Corinthians that the man repented and returned to the body of Christ. Isn't that wonderful? You know, an example that I have is I was born again when I was 15 and the wonderful, wonderful person who shared Jesus with me uh, was kind enough to bring me to youth meetings on Friday nights. And I totally and completely dedicated my life to the Lord. Um, the person who shared Jesus with me uh, had joy and loved Jesus, but after every Friday night uh, youth meeting, we would leave the church and um, she would hang out with people and, and drink and party. So she was my ride, she was my ride to church and since I was 15, I followed along with her but didn't partake in the drinking and, and so on and so forth. As I grew in the Lord and as I got my driver's license, I knew I had to separate myself from her because she was living a sinful lifestyle and I had to make that separation. And I think we're all called to do that. The Bible says that we must not associate with those in the church who are sexually immoral, greedy, idolaters, slanderers, drunkards, or swindlers. And different places in the New Testament give all kinds of other people that we're not supposed to associate with. Um, the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about who we're not to associate with. Uh, but churches, unfortunately, because it's never addressed, for churches are full of people involved in these sins, and they're kept very, very comfortable by preaching that is a very, very comfortable gospel. You know, in our years of pastoring, we've had teenagers come to us, and their mother or father are committing adultery, and the teen's heart is just broken and in, in great distress. Or are people in the church that slander Christian gossips. Um, as pastors, we've been victims of all kinds of crazy and wild lies and, and, and slander. And um, it's very um, disheartening to see Christians act that way. As a pastor's wife, um, pastoring over 27 years, I can only think of two ladies in, uh, in our church that I was confident uh, over all the years that they went there that they would not uh, talk behind my back uh, and, and gossip behind my back. And I think that that's really sad. Um, there's people who um, reverence or follow politicians or a political party over Jesus and his words. Um, there's Christians who curse and drink and get a buzz and, they're, and that's really now common among Christians. Uh, like I've said before, pornography is as common in Christians as it is in the general public. So you can see there's so much sin in the church and it really, really should be addressed. And we really need to judge um, what we're letting in the church congregation. The Bible says that we're to judge them and not associate with them. And I know this is really freaky for a lot of people, but that's what the Bible says. And the whole goal, the whole 100% of the goal is to get them to repent, to repent, to repent, and turn their lives around and quit walking in that sin and to get right with God. And of course, we only ultimately get right with God through the blood of Jesus Christ, but God does tell us to deny ourselves and to live a holy life. Um, my husband and I have had to not associate with Christian people who are gossips and love to cause strife um, you know the thing about that is is when you have to avoid a person it makes you feel really bad it makes you feel like you're not loving them that you're not walking in love it makes you feel guilty but the Bible commands us the Word of God commands us to uh, if we are walking in love to avoid people like that God wants them to repent and it's so important um, an example of this is 
uh, we knew a Christian who worked at a bank. We knew this person for many years and this person was at our house on a holiday because she didn't have any family in town. This person started talking about other people's bank accounts and their financial woes and their loan applications and we were, I, we didn't even know what to do. We were so shocked and there, there were family members there and other people and it was just, it was just a situation that, that you know, the, the air kind of goes out of the room. But from that day, we never invited this person to our house again um, because we had to separate ourselves from her uh, because of slander and gossip and, and poor ethics. And it's very sad, it's heartbreaking, but um, a person needs to realize that their sin has consequences. In Titus 3 verse 10, Titus 3 verse 10, it says, warn a diver divisive person once, and then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. You know, this is a form of judgment. We judge in our mind that this person is divisive, that they're uh, uh, causing strife, and the Bible says have nothing to do with them. And that's, that's a form of judgment, that we are judging that they're causing strife and division. Um, some translations say to avoid these kind of people. In Romans 16, 17, in the New Living Translation, it says, and now I make one more appeal, my dear brothers and sisters, watch out for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you have been taught. Stay away from them. Ooh, the Bible is telling us to stay away from certain people who are actually in the church. Did you know in the book of Deuteronomy, the phrase, you must purge yourself from evil is used 10 times in dealing with the people of Israel who sinned. God wanted to keep his people set apart and holy. And so people that were committing sin, the Bible in Deuteronomy, it says 10 different times to purge yourself from that evil. And what he's talking about is getting rid of those people. And unfortunately, in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, many times that meant stoning the offender. Well, thank God we live in uh, the New Testament, not in Old Testament times. We live under a new covenant with better promises. That being said, it illustrates how God feels about sin and in his church and among his people. God does not want his people to be in sin. In 2 Thessalonians 3.11, it says, For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who, uh, now those who are as such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. So Paul is telling them, you know, these people, especially these people that are busybodies, you know, tell them what they should be doing. And if they don't change, if they don't repent, if they don't change their ways, do not keep company with him so that he would be ashamed. Why is that? Because Paul wants them to repent. Uh, verse 15, yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. The goal is repentance and re reconciliation, but definitely do not allow it in your church congregation. 2 Timothy 3.1 says, but mark this, there will be uh, terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. While he has quite a long list there of things that will be happening in the end times and what what people who say that they're Christians will be acting like. And at the end of verse five, it says, have nothing to do with them. That is a form of judgment. 
Uh, and God calls us to do that in a very humble, a very loving and kind way because God wants them to realize that they're walking in sin, that it's not the life that God wants them to live so that they will repent and be uh, joined back with the body of Christ. You know, in the past week, sworn testimony has come out that a popular news agency, which has many, many Christians in it as its core customers, was lying and slandering and causing division, all while knowing they were deceiving their listeners. The testimony was backed up with emails and text messages between uh, the news commentators. It was done to keep their power, their audience, and their revenue stream. And, and that is in, in the information, in the sworn testimony. Many of these news uh, people proudly proclaim their Christianity. According to the scriptures, we need to judge them and avoid them. So we think, you know, well, are you saying, Diane, that you're perfect or that there's certain people in the church that are perfect and don't sin? You know, we all fall short and say and do and think things that are not pleasing to God. But we all need to always put the microscope, the magnifying glass on ourselves and always be um, evaluating ourselves, our actions, our hearts, our minds, that they would be pure before God. You know, there's so many times when a thought goes through my mind or something that I shouldn't be thinking about or dwelling on, and I just say, Lord, purify my heart. Just purify my heart, Lord God, because I don't want to be seeing, saying those things or thinking those things. We need to be constantly vigilant of our own lives so that we're not uh, violating scriptures. So we can see from the scriptures we have read, and, and there's mon many, many, many more, the importance of good judgment in regards to those we associate with and those that we allow in our church bodies. As I, as I close, a word of caution, remember the words of Jesus on the other side of the story, the dangers of being a hypocritical judge, not considering our, considering our own faults and our own shortcomings. I'm, again, I'm going to read it, Matthew 7, uh, verse 1. Do not judge, or in other words, do not damn, do not convict, don't be fault-finding, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? So in other words, you need to look at yourself first. We all need to look at ourselves first. You know, am I causing division? Am I a gossip? Am I talking behind people's back? Am I sexually immoral? Am I stealing things? Am I unethical? You know, just all these things we need to ask ourselves. Um, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of, out of your own eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So our goal should always be love and reconciliation. Our goal is to have the body of Christ here on this earth, to walk in holiness uh, before God, to honor him, to be pleasing to him, and um, to, to be the light, the light of the world, so that we can show people uh, the goodness of God. Well, I would like to encourage you. I know this has been a very different kind of a sermon, something that people don't usually preach, but it's all throughout the New Testament. How, um, you know, people get the willies if, if, you know, you address sin. They really do, and they say, oh, judge not lest ye be judged. But the Bible talks about over and over and over again in the New Testament, there are some things we're supposed to judge, and the very first thing we're supposed to judge is ourselves. So let your goal be reconciliation, let your goal be love, and let your goal be holiness before the Lord for you and your church body. Well, if you've never experienced the new life that Jesus Christ can give you, I just encourage you today to turn your life around, turn away from sin, and ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Trust in him, believe that God sent him here for you, and that he raised him from the dead, and that the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse you of all your sin. Just call on him today and ask him to forgive you. Well, if you do that, please let us know. We'd like to pray with you. We'd like to send you a Bible. 
So um, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope this has been helpful, helpful to you. And we will see you next week. And be sure to uh, tune in on Sunday for Pastor Terry's message. Bye-bye.